we call it conservative because whenever conservative force does negative work, we don't look at that negative work done as being energy lost. We, we associate conservative force with potential energy. So whenever a conservative force does negative work, we don't look at it as being, um, as being lost. We say when conservative force does negative work, that amount of energy that's taken out by the negative work is stored as potential energy. So this is the expression that we'll use to derive a couple forms for uh, potential energy. So in the lab last Tuesday, you guys were using this formula before I had a chance to derive it. So we'll derive this today. And we'll look at the other form of potential energy, spring potential energy. So whenever with the conservative force, this is what you can say. So this is a new form of energy that we are now identifying and deriving formulas for. We say that the change of potential energy is given by the amount of work that's being done by conservative force. So I would call this negative work done by conservative force. Does it make sense that there's a negative sign here? Yeah, when a conservative force does negative work, does po do you potential energy increase or decrease? Increase, right? So when this is negative, I want the change to be positive. That's why there's a minus sign here. So you could uh, uh, write this out as the change in the potential energy is the negative of the conservative force that product with a change of position. So with the gravity, I guess it's easy, easy, easier to see that gravity is uh, predictable because we do this <laughs> every time we solve a Newton's law question. We say, you know, gravity is always downward, always mg. So in fact, when we, um, so, so let me drive this formula now. So using this expression here, imagine I have, let me use it for this for later part. Imagine I have uh, <laughs> Imagine, um, let me give you a slightly more interesting scenario. Imagine I have a slope where I'm raising um, a block is somehow being moved from this lower position here to a higher position here. Somehow it's being moved up here. So the block starts out at some height. Let me call this initial height, height equals zero, just to make it easy for myself, right? No reason to introduce unnecessary numbers. And when the block goes up here, let me say this final height is um, um, capital H. Yep. So, so this is a situation that we know how to analyze. Um, if a block is moving somehow from here to here, then uh, let me make things easier to think through and say that it's uh, almost at rest every single time. Like it's not moving up the hill because I gave it, gave it an initial push and, let it, and then let go. Um, it just you know, starts out at rest and I'm just pushing it up slowly. So that slowly it reaches the top here. So you know, when you think about the situa situation, visualize it, what you should realize is that there must be at least two forces acting on it, right? Yes, because there's gravity pulling it down, mg. If that's the only force acting on it, then like, it's going to move downward, right? What are the other forces acting on this box? Normal. There's normal force. But if you, when you draw the normal force, that's not enough. Because if all, these are the only forces acting, it'll slide downward. So what else is there? Yeah, there's applied force. So I must be applying some amount of force to make this block slowly slide upward. So there is all this picture in the background, but what I want you to pay attention to right now is the work being done by gravity. How much work is being done by gravitational force? So, um, I guess the easiest thing to do is actually just go through the math and calculate it. So, um, so 
we want to calculate this expression here, dot product between the conservative force, gravity, and the displacement. The displacement vector here would be something that looks like this. This would be my displacement vector. Yeah. Let's just try applying the definition here and see what we can get. So to apply the definition here, let me uh, copy the figure into clean area here so that I can, clean area here so that I can label things better. So gravitational force vector, mg is downward. Uh, displacement vector, it's going this way. Let me label a couple other things that, uh, that really should have been specified in the question. Somebody should have told you this angle theta, and somebody should have told you, well, I guess that's it actually. Yeah. So um, to label that angle theta here, I need a horizontal here, and this would be theta. And so this is what the definition tells you, that the work done by, uh, work done, work done by force of gravity, that work done by gravity is equal to force mg as a vector, that product with the displacement. All right, um, I guess. There are different ways to do it. Let me just try using, uh, applying the definition just to straightforward. Like it says, you know, that uh, uh, mg cosine theta. So let me just uh, do that. Um, mg, so that's the magnitude times the distance, delta x, times, when it says cosine theta, is it this theta that it's talking about or a different angle? Different angle, right? It's talking about uh, this angle here, angle between the two vectors. So let me use a different symbol for this, phi. So it's uh, mg delta x times cosine of phi. I want to express this in terms of theta. Um, in the interstellar time, let me do this uh, using some numbers. So you can use angle addition formula to do this purely algebraically, but I think it, I can illustrate my point better if I use uh, specific numbers. So let me do that. Uh, let me make the numbers easy for myself. I'll say theta is equal to 30 degrees. Um, that will also mean a couple of things uh, because it's a special 30 degree angle. Height h is equal to delta x over two. Like I have those nice numbers. So, um, so if a theta is 30 degrees, what's a phi? Phi is 90 plus 30, so 120 degrees. Anybody here happen to know what cosine of 120 degrees is? Negative one half? Yeah, negative one half, right? So when I plug in these specific numbers here, then I get mg times delta x times minus one half. And let me plug in what delta x is in terms of a height h. So delta x in terms of a height h is mg, so it, I have expression here, so it'll be two times the height times minus one half. So for this particular value of angle that I have used, the expression you end up with, work on by gravity in this situation, is equal to minus mgh. And what I will state without proving it, to prove it you have to use the angle addition formula, is that this relationship will be true no matter what angle you use. And this is actually one of the properties of that product that I didn't have time to get to on Tuesday. The dot product takes the projection of the vector. So when you take the dot product between this uh, displacement vector and this vertical vector, the component of displacement that matters is the vertical component. It's this vertical component that matters and, um, 
and it, you know, that's just the height h. And it works for all other angles that you might use. So, so this is the work done by gravity. You use it here to drive the change in potential energy uh, due to graft, change in gravitational potential energy. So change in gravitational potential energy is equal to minus of all this work done, minus mgh. So these two minuses cancel. And so when there's a change in height of h, change in gravitational potential energy is mgh. And that was the formula that you were using last time. And um, so that's why, you, that's why you care about the change in height alone, not change the entire distance that you travel over the ramp. Good. Does this example make sense as uh, um, the potential energy that gets stored as a result of the negative work being done by gravity? Yes, no. And here the confidence is this. Um, so as I'm pushing this uh, gravity, did all that negative work, taking out kinetic energy that might have gone into the box. The confidence here is this. When I let go of the box, then the box will roll down on its own. So to give you an actual physical example, I have this ramp. So when I have this incline of the ramp, so as I, was, as I use, apply a force to push this up, without gravity, when I'm applying force, it would have accelerated upward. But because gravity was constantly pulling it down, it didn't gain all that kinetic energy. So even with all my push up here, it ends up with a zero kinetic energy. But this is the confidence I have from the fact that gravity is a conservative force. That when I let go of this hand, gravity will continue to act, and it will turn the energy that, the potential energy that's here into kinetic energy. So I don't have the confidence with the friction. With the friction, if uh, as I was pushing, friction took out all that energy of you know, work that I'm doing, so it gains no kinetic energy. I don't have the confidence that when I let go of my hand, friction will snap it back to where it came from. Like Friction doesn't do that. So that's the key distinction between uh, conservative force and a non-conservative force like friction. And so when you are dealing with a conservative force, you calculate the work done. And you say that gets actually stored into this form of energy because you think you are going to be able to get it back. So the difference of you know, lending money to a friend who's never paid you back versus uh, depositing your money into bank. Like when you deposit it to bank, you think you're going to get it back. So it gets counted as your net worth. But if you're lending money to someone who's proven unreliable, then like, you don't count it as your net worth because you don't think you're going to get it back. 